Uh, just working straight. In full park. Yes. Yeah. So we've been for the entire time. Mm. All right. Yeah, I did that. I did that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, um, you can call this paper a survey of reconstruction, the service reconstruction from point files or the real title, the version of the paper that I got had two titles. It's kind of confusing once people in here see me because I, I didn't remember the original title. Um, this is an old survey. So basically, why do we want to read old surveys or present them? Um, can, we, can, we can you move the um, all the image the right hand side? Yeah. And cut away if you can. Yeah, thanks. Um, so basically, I mean, I've been I, I did like three talks on uh, deep learning based methods for service reconstruction and. I'm, um, and just, I'm going to write a paper or review paper on some of those methods and uh, surveys and review papers that in my mind are related. Um, but also, uh, I wanted I, I sort of wanted to cover a survey paper to get the the structure and the style of, uh, uh, into my mind before I started writing because that's usually how I write. Um, I don't. I don't plagiarize, but I like to do like that sort of uh, neural style transfer where you kind of like basically see like what's out there and then support it to what you're writing um, stylistically. Uh, this is an old enough survey to where like there's no way I could plagiarize it because everything I'm doing is already based. Everything here is uh, is not. But um, more importantly, um, this this paper covers. Uh, uh, algorithms that are pretty deep learning era. And um, I think because deep learning is a back is a black box in a lot of situations, it's uh, we have a tendency to like not really understand what's going on in the black box and in the difficulties of the algorithm uh, the, the neural network facing, um, which is like replacing all these algorithms. So um, the all these pick papers that had that were dealing with uh, algorithms that weren't black boxes. Um, seem to have much greater awareness of like um, prior assumptions that, that the algorithms are um, based on. And uh, I think being aware of that's pretty uh, useful. And as I read the survey, you can kind of see like, like each section of the survey is like, if you jump ahead 10 years, it's kind of like somebody's created like a deep learning based method that basically did the same thing as I was going to do. Uh, modern era, and uh, I'm I, I more and more commonly these days see like people tweet about that her people reference like really old papers when they're uh, creating like cutting edge stuff and um, like basically stuff's been done before, but before there was GPUs. And if you can think of a way to do old stuff in a way that, that works in deep learning or with GPUs, then you've got a really good paper. So um, recall that this paper is doing surface reconstruction for point clouds. And um, point clouds, uh, like here's an example over here where like a, a point cloud of a house where segmentation has been done. There's no surface reconstruction, but um, basically whenever you like, uh, the paper covers the fact that like in different domains, like in urban environments like a house or like in single objects, like if you're scanning like a like an object that you're trying to 3D print or something, um, or in light or there's point clouds, like each of these environments, different prior assumptions make uh, uh, make the service reconstruction problem um, better. And uh, I thought it was interesting to, to see all this. So. Uh, so some problems that uh, like basically all data science has to deal with, but uh, also in surveys, um, like non-uniform sampling of data. So uh, basically, it's kind of like having a training set that doesn't cover everything you're going to see at this time. Um, and uh, noisy data, basically, uh, like. All data has a little bit of noise to it, and all the algorithms have to figure out ways to accommodate that noise, um, which is a little bit easier to deal with than like 
outliers because you, you can um you can model the noise but the outliers are uh, not so easy to model and you basically would be better off throwing them out um according to the paper uh this misaligned scans so like sometimes you like if you're doing like a partial scan and then like you move the scanner and then you scan a little bit scan again like there's a corollary in MRI like the, like the time sequence where like if you have movement then like you have misaligned scans and work is done in MRI to make sure that MRIs are aligned and things like this um so th that's an interesting thing to me because like like a big part of the slow part of the surface reconstruction algorithms in deep learning is uh the, the pre-processing stage where you're you're doing image registration and making sure that things are like processed correctly like you're trying to align things that aren't aligned correctly and stuff like this and um like if you try to get a neural network to do all of that it's kind of like like you might not even think too deeply about it if all you're doing is throwing neural data the deep learning algorithm but um like you could have a whole bunch of misaligned scans that like map to the same kind of like output so how did, how would you even like get the deep learning algorithm to address that? That's something I'm kind of thinking about lately. Um, missing data, like I said earlier, is it's kind of like uh, in our domain. It's kind of like you have like uh, if you had like a tumor in one section of the brain and not another section of the brain, and then like at training time and and every time it's the somebody has the exact same tumor but it's somewhere else in the brain. Um, how does deep learning algorithms handle this? That sort of thing. But uh, in the point cloud, in the survey paper, uh, basically, like if you're the scanner, sometimes things are occluded, and for other reasons, sometimes the, the scanner just like doesn't get a good signal back, and you'll have missing parts of the point cloud. And uh, a lot of the algorithms, like their whole job is figuring out ways to just like try to reconstruct uh, things from bad data. Uh, Okay, um, so one thing that's extremely useful for surface reconstruction is in addition to having the point cloud, you have uh, surface normals. So basically like if every point tells you whether or not it's inside the surface or outside the surface, um, and there's like a directionality that like basically like is pointing inside or outside of the surface. Um, and that's missing in some situations. So. Uh, when that's missing, it can be recalculated by doing like localized PCA and then um, around a point and then finding the normal of a plane that's reconstructed from that. Um, there's a bunch of different methods that's described in this section that basically like, but all of them have to define some notion of uh, what is a local neighborhood to a point because you have to like basically like decide whether you're going to include the neighborhood. And you have to go back and you have to think like, is this like, is this data any good in that neighborhood? Like it's an outright code element. So it's just like you're trying to find the tile that best fits the like the group of points that you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so oriented normals, if you if you have data that has the point cloud where the 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 uh you know the direction the uh, like basically the plane of the surface at each point, um you can use that to reconstruct uh more efficiently. But like occasionally, like you'll have like badly labeled stuff, so you get like weird artifacts in your um, reconstructions. Um, I, in in some of the previous talks, said that the one of the loss function was uh, based on which the orientation of the normals of the meshes that it was uh, using its ground truths. So basically, um, this there's kind of like a relationship between these concepts and the loss functions in the modern methods. Uh, so you like you know, the most basic loss in service reconstruction and deep learning is like an MSC loss, but that's kind of inefficient because like you don't have like correspondence between points in the target and ground through the More realistically, they they do things like calculate camper distance, which is like looking for points that are near each other and calculating the distance and then some minimum distance. But in addition to these distance methods, you can have a loss function that's based on um so this is pretty interesting to me um that like basically uh it, one way to kind of like filter out bad data is like to have like a confidence associated with whether or not 
each point in the point cloud you think is uh, located correctly. And basically, if your scanner can provide you with that confidence level, it basically give you a weight, weight to like for like a weighted sum or something like this. You can like throw out or mask out uh, things below a certain confidence. Uh, so RGB imagery um, for, with point clouds, you can you can use like RGB alone, uh, which is like just a picture image 2D. Um, but it's better if it's accompanied accompanied with depth information, like for example, with like the Kinect or like LiDAR or something like this. Um, but uh, in computer vision, you can also use like calibrated stereo cameras and stuff like this. So like if you have like if you take a bunch of pictures with your cameras and then you like you know where, where of known points, you can get depth perception without any sensors and then sort of that's what we do basically. But um vision is back without like any of this is like an outpost problem because like uh like when you take a single picture of of, of some sort of uh, uh, landscape or something like whether you're closer and it's small or whether you're far away and it's large is all of this stuff is roughly the same image so like um, you have to like make some assumptions going in to, to sort of do a legitimate type of description. Um, shape classes so like some assumptions you can exploit uh, is like I was mentioning like, if you're in an urban environment you can Kind of assume buildings and buildings have like right angles and stuff like this so you can use um squares and rectangles and diamonds and stuff like this um organic shapes uh don't follow that pattern so like uh finding primitives for this is a little bit harder um i'll talk a little bit more about primitives later but um uh, i think you actually mentioned the paper where they did a lot of service reconstruction with shape primitives that I read that was pretty cool. It's one of the reasons that I thought this paper was a little bit interesting, but um, it's kind of like a prior work to deep learning where they basically did that concept. Um, so and, uh, like CAD CAD drawings, like man-made shapes, they often follow, have these primitives within them, like circles, cylinders, spheres, and stuff like this. Um, I, yeah, I kind of basically covered all this, but this like drawing, down here, like kind of shows you like somebody that's just doing architectural drawings. I mean, you can see like there's like a lot of rectangles. Uh that they're like basically what you're kind of trying to do is make it to where like the possibilities in your um uh, the possible surface reconstructions are a low dimensional shape space. So like like when you have like if you don't have any prior assumptions, like it's like count, countably infinite, like how many different ways you can, maybe uncountably, how many different ways you can fit something. But um, if you only have like a set of, a, a countable set of things that you could fit, and it reduces the scope of your problem and makes solving things easier. Uh, implicit functions, I guess. Okay. Um, I mean, these come up all the time in, in the modern deep learning. That's uh, the, and, the implicit functions that I encounter basically are things like occupancy grids and um, sign distance functions. And basically, the sign distance function tells you at like every point of like some space, like whether you're inside or outside of uh, shape. So and it gives you a distance to the shape and, and like the shortest distance. Um, an indicator function is basically a function that like is either zero or one based on some characteristic and it has a lot of like properties from set theory like um like has like operators for and and intersection and union and stuff like this uh okay so this is more like a little bit more uh, this uh martian cubes are still used for surface reconstruction um, you can it and in conjunction with sine distance functions. So, like basically, a marching cube walks around this uh, shape at like a level set, which is like a place where the sine distance function is going to be zero, and it uh, chooses from like a, a limited range of potential surfaces that fit a cube. So, like 
that's like a localized region. If, if there's like any, any, if you're zero here and there's like points that are like bordering in this fashion or this fashion, it will choose like a corresponding plane. If there's multiple points, it might like, like fit two planes, stuff like this. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's been around probably since the 90s. Um, it's still used. It's, I don't like it because it uh, creates these like, they are set artifacts within your reconstruction that are kind of unsightly unless you have a really had high resolution sun density function. And um, I always, always say density, it's sun distance function, uh, sun distance field. Yeah. Um, so octrees, I, I've kind of seen them, like I, I've seen like a paper on octrees. Um, basically, they, they kind of like recursively subdivide things and do better fits as they do subdivisions, but I haven't read that many papers about in modern times about octrees. Um, no, same thing with the, the Lana refinement group techniques. I haven't seen that, that these techniques ported into modern methods very well. Um, but apparently the, the Lana triangulation is a way of like specifying triangles and circles that fit the points. And the dual problem is a Voronoi diagram. Uh, so the smoothness priors, uh, basically like uh, there, a lot of the methods try to constrain smoothness. Um, that's one of the reasons they use uh, Delaunay tri triangulation, I believe, is because like it, like it says, it, uh, it maximizes like the minimum angle or something like this. So like you, uh, if you have a mesh, you don't have like sharp points, but you'll have like more gradual change throughout the, the mesh. Uh, so, and people use smoothness as a way to avoid having to do topology correction in modern methods. Um, topology correction is one of the most wasteful things in uh, pre -surf. So uh, there's these categories of uh, reconstruction methods that use uh, basically splines. Um, so they use like loaded repolynomials, but early on, uh, Sergey was interested in using splines um, to do uh, fits to the brain. And the reason splines are really nice is because they have like a, they're smooth and continuous. So they have, they're differentiable and they, um, like we're kind of like truck. We would ideally we would like to have like an infinite resolution where like you zoom in, you zoom in, and like you can it like wherever you are, it's smooth and continuous. But uh, the the problem I ran into it with trying to use splines is that there's no APIs to to do back propagation from a spline itself. I, there's probably ways to sample from a spline and do do back propagation that way. But I just didn't think about because I'm not really familiar. With that sort of technique, but um, so I'm a little bit more curious about how you did this and why I ran into trouble. So you were, what were you, what was the output of the network was the, like the equation for a spline and then that was a differentiable one, why not? Yeah. Um, so like if you use, um, like, so, so a lot of the spline algorithms use like things like argmax or like, like the, the like use like indices within the algorithm instead of like just like the, the output. So like when you're using like the indices of an array as part of your algorithm, it doesn't. It's not like a differentiable function. So um, your whole computation graph has to be like a differentiable. You, you can't just frame it as a classification problem. Is it two dimensional? You probably can't. I just I, I I didn't pursue it further because like most of the literature was using meshes so, and kind of like in their APS exists for meshes. So I just like the path of least resistance was the kind of key message. But the nice thing about it, if you did find a way to use a spline is you, there's like a lot of algorithms to create a mesh from a spline. So um, it's kind of like a more general thing. Um, uh, another another uh, set of cat a category of uh, smoothness priors, they uh, basically hierarchically fit the problem. So like, They'll um they'll do like a, a, a course fit and then they'll like zoom in on a region and like do more refined fitting and you could kind of think of like maybe like having 
like a loss function calculated each one of these steps. Uh, a large portion of the literature uses radial basis functions to do fitting, and the nice thing about RBFs is that they're smooth and uh, they're seamless. And here's a lot of different uh, uh, basis functions for RBFs. Uh, my familiarity with RBFs in practice is from support vector machines, where uh, the basic kernel is a linear kernel, but the, uh, the, the most common kernel I ever saw use is RBF kernel, which usually it's Gaussian. Uh, indicator functions. I'm going to skip this slide. I mean, basically, like there are functions that are either zero or one. And uh, upcoming in the next slide, there's uh, one way to enforce smoothness is like the use of, with the use of, use of divergence. And like basically, like you're trying to make sure that the, the gradient is smooth and that the surface is near and stuff like this. And you can do this by solving the they call it the Poisson equation. To this equation, which involves like, divergence. Um, X is some implicit function, and M is a normal field. Of, so, like, if you go back to like the normal field, is like the directionality of the surface at each point. Uh, yeah, so uh, visibility priors. Uh, visibility is provided by the scanner. Um, so like there's like three cl classes of methods that I'm going to describe in the future slides. Um, sometimes the visibility is provided by the scanner, sometimes it's not. Um, and I'll get back to a little bit more into that later. Um, so basically, the most common method for using visibility information is when it's provided by the scanner. Uh, merge, uh, and then you basically you merge, you have to merge scans after, which is like one of the most important and I mentioned confidence earlier, like if the each point has uh, confidence associated with it, you can throw out certain points. Um, basically, this is a method to combat that data. Um, ex exterior visibility, like there's a, a whole section of methods that kind of focus on it. It's probably because of computer vision, I would guess, but I don't really know. But it, like it reminded me of like clipping from computer vision where you basically are. Um, your perspective is really important. So like, like this point cloud is a three-dimensional thing, but like the reconstruction you're doing is actually like from a specific perspective. And you want to discard like the reasons that are occluded, like this black reason. Um, another thing that came up is something called cone carving, where basically they like, they take a bunch of different perspectives and then they merge the visibility cone in order to do a re reconstruction. Parity is kind of an interesting concept. Uh, basically, parity is, um, I wonder if there's any way to use this as a loss function. I don't really know, but uh, parity of a point basically is a simple way of determining whether you're inside or outside of a uh, probably a, um, genus zero surface, where basically, like, if if like an odd number of intersections, like you, you take a line segment and it doesn't matter which direction it goes, but if, if it intersects the surface an odd number of times, you're on the interior and if it's otherwise it, you're on the exterior surface. Uh, I don't know, that's just fun out movement concepts. Uh, so this is kind of more interesting and uh, useful probably. Uh, just. Um, the uh, fitting the point cloud basically like helps if you have these primitives like I mentioned earlier like primitives like ransacks a famous algorithm that does this it um, looks for planes spheres cylinders cones and tori and so basically it finds the nearest fit of these primitives it doesn't fit perfectly and then like out algorithms that come after like look to uh, do like a like a, an adjustment on whatever ransack found. And uh, these primitives have to be merged and stitched together. Uh, and in the volumetric space, like cuboids would be an example of a primitive. Um, limitations as primitive methods don't grade gracefully when dictionary of primitives poorly represents the shape. So, um, I think that's, uh, 
interesting to think about in terms of MRI because like that's like basically organic that doesn't really follow like the right angle. And yeah, like, you even think of a primitive that would work with MRI? I can't. I, I, I can't. I mean, I, they had like uh, they the, later they mentioned something called like data driven stuff where it's like basically you, you start from kind of like an maybe you could build like an atlas of brain and use like like previous brain scans as your primitives or yeah. your segmentations of your primitives. But so there was a an engine a decade ago uh, for video games that tried to use essentially spheres instead of polygons. Uh, nobody adopted it. Mm -hmm. um, because polygons are just better. Uh, <laughs> they, because we can get so granular with them now, because we have so much good hardware, they they will perfectly represent, not perfectly, of course, but they will, to like a really accurate point, represent most surfaces, even things with like high curves. I think it's the whole idea behind like, you know, everything is... Um, Approximated as piecewise length, and uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know any of the new work on uh, primitives, but I mean, she's like a primitive, right? Like you could reconstruct any surface with any primitive, right? To some degree, right? Uh, it's just a question of how complex and or, or, or like inter self intersecting the ultimate surface becomes, and so how much work you have to do to clean up it or something. So I think mathematically, like. So you like if you use a square as a primitive, let's say its surface area is intrinsically larger than a triangle, mm -hmm. and so you you are essentially losing information. Right. And of course, spheres like unless they are incredibly granular, you're gonna see the yeah. divots. And so I mean, yeah, you can use anything for anything. Uh, but <laughs> they just use triangles at the end of the day, or what's the uh, triangles or polygons, depending on if you're in three D. Or not right, like, like, I like the idea of like the brain being like a hierarchical classifier, and at every classification stage, there's like a like a like a class representation template. Like, uh, and there's been like a study, tiny studies on the brain. Like, if you ask somebody like to identify like an animal, like a, at the level of like a bird or a, like a, a horse or something, they do it quickly. But if you ask them like specifically, do you like exact type of bird, like? The, it takes a longer amount of time. It's like they go bird and like parakeet. So like, I, I kind of think that like it's possible you get like classifiers at each one of these stages and like more kind of templates at each one of these stages. But like, um, the 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 only th other thing that comes to mind with like primitives and what we do is like uh, with capsule networks and particle relationships. I think that like particle relationships and the capsule networks, kind of like it's like. It, I don't know if primitive is the right word, but like you have like a template maybe of like these different parts of holes and you're looking for like multiple primitives and per templates that are together in one place. So uh, is there work on like kind of dynamic primitives? Like trying to, like is that, sorry, is that kind of what you're suggesting? Um, I well, I mean, I don't know what you mean, but like yeah. I, I know that the like that the Atlas idea is the closest thing that, that comes to mind. It's like basically like if you're if you don't think you have right angles, but you have a data set, you can use like parts of your data set to come up with like averages of, of the behavior in order to create a template, which you can use as kind of a primitive. I guess what you mean, like if you you can be more granular, like you can first classify roughly the brain region, and then within the brain region, like for example, the parakeet example, like let's say bird is in this brain region. If you want someone to do parakeet, then you can first go to the general area, and then you go deeper, and then you go deeper. Oh, and okay. So basically, like a, a essentially a hierarchy of numbers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. In general, I'm kind of interested in like how how like like I think that like in, there's like two forces kind of that drive like 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 people improving net, like single networks so that single networks by themselves can do more. And then, like people that build like ensembles in order to compensate for the fact that those like more powerful single networks don't exist yet. So, like, I think you'll see like ensembles that are created that will do the work that later single networks will be able to do. The, the, this survey is interesting though because it gives you. I don't know how much the deep learning for surface reconstruction has thought about input and output representation. Right, that's a huge part of 
creating a learnable problem. Uh, I think you've touched on some different ways. That, I mean, the spline idea is interesting in this sort of primitive transformation. I would actually, yeah, I was actually going to, I was thinking that when you were talking about that, like the fact that other people are doing something else may actually be a catalyst to not do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturation is right. Of pain. Because the fact that everyone else does it also makes it really hard to make any incremental improvement because probably the reason why people haven't published it is maybe because <laughs> it didn't work when they tried it is yeah. what I've been finding out. And then, um, yeah, it could be just cool because, yeah, it does give you like infinite resolution. Mm -hmm. It just gives you one equation. And I like the idea of classification. Like if you could classify, let's say, I mean, that boundary that you were talking about, right? Like the plus minus and then uh, what's it called? The distance uh, function. Yeah, some distance. Right. Or something. You can classify essentially, right? You can just do like a, train your spline to be a classifier that finds exactly a uh, like a classification uh, area. Mm -hmm. So that the plus, so that you have, if you think of a plus one and minus one as the two classes, you can find a decision function with your fly maybe that fits exactly around that decision function. Okay. And then you can kind of train it as like a classifier like you were talking about. Right. Um, so interesting in this paper, I mean, like if you look at any of like Michael Bronstein stuff or like the course that you came out with that we like have a, or we would like to sort of do a three group on. Um, uh, basically, like all the stuff covered in the sec, like a lot of the stuff covered here comes up in his work where they talk about symmetry and uh, then cannot, cannot like that. Creating equivariance is basically revolves around the study of symmetry. And basically, the idea is that current networks understand the symmetries that you're likely to see. And you don't have to do as much data augmentation. You can have smaller data sets, you can generalize better. Um, Repetition, uh, obviously, like repeated patterns come up a lot in, in things. So, if you can recognize there's a repetition, it's kind of like simplifies you. But uh, part whole relationships, uh, those help. Um, I think it's kind of kind of feel like motivated to go read caps on networks again. But um, data driven prior priors. This section, they talked a little bit more about how, like, if you don't have primitives that fit your domain, that what do you do? Um, and if I had, like, it would have been really interesting to kind of drill it down into it a little bit more, but um, it was too much detail. So um, basically, the the methods that were of interest to me were uh, one where they they first semantically segment the image. So they, they're not doing brains, but this was just like graphic that I came up. So they segment the brain. And then they um, they replace each segment with a surface that fits that segment. And um, I mentioned that Eloy earlier um, paper that I found from uh, the pre surfer group, uh, um, Bruce, a uh, guy named Adrian Dalka. He's done unsupervised brain segmentation. So, like building off of that paper, like if you can, can make the assumption that you have unsupervised brain segmentation. Um, then you can sort of start your unsupervised service reconstruction uh, with uh, brain segmentation. I thought that would be an interesting way to place to start. Um, but one thing that I haven't, I mean, like it, this talks about, like, I mean, there's multiple ways to segment a brain, I guess, like if you segment a white peel or you can segment it into more specific reasons. But, um, if you if you do like multiple reconstructions, you'll have to merge them. So it'll be like some sort of, uh, you have to like think of like ways to discard stuff we don't actually need. Uh, another interesting thing to me was the non rigid retrievals, which I think there's like something out here at, at the literature that I've seen. Now I remember what it's called. I didn't have time to look it up, but I think it has something to do with like uh, it has, it's kind of like image registration, it's kind of like image warping or something. Like basically, you have a template and you warp it to another thing. Uh, cortical flow essentially does this, and the people that the group that uh, wrote cortical flow, they have some papers where they uh, that aren't service reconstruction, but they uh, they'll like warp a template into another image in order to um, 
in order to like do a segmentation or something like this. But, um, and the the the, oh, but the the unsupervised segmentation paper starts from Annapolis, which is kind of like the primitive and uh, like a library of templates uh, that would be worked for the brain, and it warps that atlas uh, in such a way that it matches the MRI image. So um, that that this concept is actually uh, useful to unsupervised methods in MRI uh, segmentation. Uh, the evaluation of service reconstruction. Okay, so it's kind of near the end. This, there's a few sections I skipped that I wasn't that interested in. Um, but the uh, geometric accuracy just is like the distance measure that I mentioned earlier, like camper distance. So like you're you're like calculating like how close the surface is to each other. That's one way of evaluating the reconstruction. Um, another way is to look at topology. So like the famous like a coffee cup is a donut idea um like how many holes does your your uh, your thing have your service reconstruction have uh structure recovery structure was kind of vaguely defined in this paper um, um but our primitives repetitions and symmetries preserved was the question i would ask and like the ease of use and reproducibility so like it, there's some methods that i've had to look at that are like they're real they look really elegant but they're they're not really well documented and they're um the code's kind of partially uh, works out of the box. And it, like, it, it, there are just so many barriers to reproducibility that even though it's like some of the best methods that I've seen in terms of the paper that was written, it's like the, the reproducibility is atrocious. So like, I might have to find different ways to do it. So, um, and then basically that's the talk. And surveys are my nightmare, so. <laughs> like the first survey paper I did a talk on, it was just, just like so bad. He really tried to like help, and it was just like, ugh. Yeah. it was it was like one of Bronstein's papers, sort of like the geometry deep learning stuff, and it, like he covers like everything in that domain, and it's just it's like there's so much, there's like no way to like get it all in your brain. Um, but it's interesting. I guess what do you think you're landing on in terms of Sort of deep learning based approaches based on the survey. Like, do you have um, sort of new inspiration, or do you think? It's well, I mean, the first, my first thing is to write a review paper, and um, my my ADD brain has a way has a tendency to like generate a bazillion ideas while I'm doing things. So, like, but like, um, uh, for the the thing that's most interesting to me is like unsupervised reconstruction for sure. Because I think that like everything, I mean, there's I, you kind of get the feeling when you do this review paper, like any any additional methods will be very incremental, and the only thing that doesn't the screams not being done is like unsupervised. And I'm sure it's like the next thing to do. So because like there's unsupervised segmentation, yeah. so it doesn't seem out of the out of line to do that. In but terms of the sort of geometric basis of your reconstruction. So you, you've dropped splines, so you're using primitive base. I'm using meshes, which is like a graphical structure. So like right. uh, basically any surface see three surface of mesh. Right, right. So meshes are nice because uh, Facebook wrote the whole PyTorch 3D package, which has a lot of like built-in loss functions right. to deal with meshes and stuff like this. So um that sort of stuff's not easy to write by yourself. And by itself, that's multiple papers, I'm sure, to write that API. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. What's going on at the next guy's talk? Yeah, well, I mean, this is done. Yeah. No, a lot of people have to leave, so I don't like 10 minutes, right? 15 minutes. Yeah. He's a mathematician from Washington that developed a framework where you can kind of learn ODEs of like uh, input data. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's a cool talk. You know, should yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just came up in uh, like three right now. Uh, 50 minutes. Oh, 50 minutes. Bring it out. I don't know what we're like. Okay. Well, we have to report. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for the talk, Will. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah, it's good time. We want uh, to use all this stuff in your work. 
Uh, not, I mean, no, that's too, too much to do all at once, but I, I think it gives you ideas of like, like most of these methods have been ported into, into deep learning approaches. So 